All right, welcome back to the Few Show, everybody. My name is Bud. I am Chief of Staff at Xfusion.io and co-host of the Few Show. I am excited to be joined today by my guest, Oscar Bayboom. Uh, Oscar is co-founder of Nickel, the lightning-fast ML platform for everyone. He is also the Senior Director of Machine Learning at Motional, where he works on ML products, research, and platform for their fleet of autonomous vehicles. Before that, he was a postdoctoral scholar at Trevor Darrell's lab at Berkeley AI Research, where he worked on automated quantification of scientific image data using deep learning. Oscar, thank you for being on the show. It's a pleasure to have you, buddy. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. You did good, hey, uh, you did good with, the last, with the last name. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I wrote it down just to make sure I had it, and then I lost where I wrote it down. I'm like, oh, no, I'm going to screw this thing up even after you told me. But I got it. I got it. Yeah. Um, so I, I wanted to go over one thing real quick uh, before we got started. So I was looking up uh, machine learning kind of versus AI. And I'm when I was looking that up, I, I saw some, some pictures and some videos uh, of a talk that you did. And you were, you had some video from some machine learning on autonomous vehicles. And it looked an awful lot like the stuff that, say, like Tesla puts out from their AI. What is the right. difference between machine learning and AI? And is there a bunch of crossover or no? Uh, you know, kind of just for the, the lay person. Can you, can you give us a, the difference there? Yeah, I think I can. So... I, I much prefer the term machine learning because AI, I mean, the, the term AI was coined a long time ago. Um, and it's, it's, it's an unfortunate term because it's, it's very hard to define. Um, there's no real good definition of it. Um, but I think the best thing I can say is that machine learning is a subset of AI. Like if you think about AI, it's sort of anything, any technology that tries to resemble intelligence, right? So that can be, a lot of these chat, you can build a pretty good chatbot, for example, um, that can resemble a human on the other side by having sort of rule-based, template-based uh, program running on the other side. So, like, if, if you type in hi, there's a, there's a line of code that says, well, I'm going to reply hi back, right? And then you can kind of just do that very manually, and that becomes an AI, in, in, in a, a dumb AI, but still, right, it would qualify as an AI. Um you could also approximate an AI with using machine learning. And when, when you say machine learning, you typically mean like statistical machine learning, right? So it's a, it's a branch of applied statistics where you say, I have the statistical model of the world and I, and I, um, I use that to make decisions based on, you know, based essentially based theory. Right. But, but, um, okay. Uh, so yeah. So ML is a subset of, of AI. I, I never use AI. I tend to really avoid using AI professionally because it's such a loosey goosey term and it's such a hype. Um, but for what it's gotcha. worth, you know, like it, we, sometimes we do it at Nickel because, well, because we're a company, we want to like get it, you know, get some get some attention. But when I talk about the technology, I, I much prefer machine learning. It's a more specific term. Okay. All right, that makes sense. So go ahead and and tell us a little bit bit about Nickel. Uh, what is it? What are you doing? When did you get started? You just got started this year, I know, but just kind of give us a little rundown of, of what's going on. Yeah, sure. So we we did we did found a company this year. I actually started tinkering with it uh, with my 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 first co-founder uh, Dan Ott um, last summer. So Nick, Nickel is a um, we tried what we tried to do is so so Dan, my, my buddy, he's um sort of a generalist software engineer. He's been he's a very experienced guy, he's been doing it for twenty years. He wanted um it all started from him wanting to add some machine learning or AI into one of one of his sites, right? He wanted to do some text classification on his site. So he's like, Okay, well that should be easy now. It's like two thousand you know, twenty, right? I should be able to just mm -hmm. uh in, in a, less than an hour get something going, right? But uh, that's not the case because a lot of the tools that are out there, the ne big name brand products like uh, Amazon SageMaker, for example, it's not really built for developers. It's built for machine learning experts to go in there and like party for, for days and weeks and months and really build a, a very sort of custom big system, right? Uh, 
Whereas for most use cases, a lot of times if you're sitting there building, you want to add some simple classification of, of images or text into your into your site. Um, you want to be able to just upload the data, annotate it right there in the browser, and then uh, you get your endpoint uh, API endpoint deployed right away. So. So that's how Nickel started. We wanted to basically build that. So you're in and out the door in, in you know, as, 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 as little as 10 minutes. Um, and the reason that's possible is, I think there's a misconception that when you think about machine learning, people think, okay, well, to use machine learning, I need tens of thousands of label data, right? So I need to first collect that data and then I need to find a workforce to annotate it. And then I need to turn this big crank here for days and then maybe I'll get a model out. Once I have a model, I go and deploy it. But the thing is with, with modern, like the advances that have happened the last few years in modern deep learning, you can actually get away with very high accuracy in like the low data regime. So you might just have say 50 or 100 annotated samples. And you can already start seeing really good accuracy and generalization of that model. Um, so that's sort of the underlying technology theme that we are, you know, relying on. And then we package mm -hmm. that into this, this platform, um, that sort of executes on that. So you have an example on your website, um, and it's just about a minute and a half long or so, right. uh, you know, and, and it has a, a gentleman on there and he has, says, let's make a function right now. Uh, basically he said, let's pull some pictures of nature and yep. uh, let's say, okay, this, let's say not a, not an animal, uh, not a bird and a bird and yep. uh, pulls a bunch of pictures of nature and he goes through and it's sped up a little bit. So I'm guessing he spends still maybe less than five minutes and yep. uh, within, within that time he can, he can say within 81% accuracy that a picture is is a bird or not and makes right. a function on his computer hey yeah this this picture is a bird or this picture isn't a bird yeah. um now we could do that in less than five minutes on our computer and that's what our machine learning can do for us how long does something like that on your end take to do can how long does it take to make that program um, for us to be able to do it in less than five minutes. I see. I see. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Um, and that's Jeremy, Jeremy, by the way, our, our third co-founder. Um, and we also have, we have also have George, uh, who's our fourth. So we're actually four guys who started the company um, together. Um, we put a lot of work. Uh, so George, for example, he was part of the team at Oracle who built out their Oracle function, which is similar to... Um, AWS Lambda. So he's, he's a very strong, like cloud backend, um, engineer. So we sort of took his expertise mm -hmm. together with my applied machine learning expertise and, 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 and build a, a, uh, they call it an auto ML engine, like an engine that basically search for the best possible model, like given any data set, how do you find the best possible performance? Uh, on that data set by searching all kinds of different machine learning paradigms or like machine learning methods. So we build the system that basically when you, while you're sitting there annotating, we're doing a ton of work in the background uh, to extract the data, to, to, to categorize it and to like sort of do a bunch of pre-work, right? So that when you finally mm -hmm. uh, do that last, so we, we require 30, 30 annotations to, uh, to train the first model. So when you finally put that third, the last one in, um, we, can, we can give you a model back in a few seconds. Um, so it's a combination of choosing the right machine learning technology and then deploying it in a, in a highly parallelized way. That's pretty incredible. I don't know. That stuff just blows my mind. Um, I, I had a gentleman yeah. on just, just recently that, uh, he does AI for, for language and, right. and I'm just like, man, all, all that stuff just, it just blows my yeah. mind what, what people can think of. So I mean, yeah, kudos I mean, to you guys. I actually did my, my PhD during the era when, you know, he shows that comic in the beginning mm -hmm. uh, about a researcher needing five years, a team to like, uh, to, to, to classify, to, to know whether it's a bird in that image. Um, 
like I was literally doing my PhD in a room with a person trying to do that. Like they they were literally doing like machine learning for bird classification, and it was so hard. It's just before the the deep learning uh, revolution. Uh, it's it was very very difficult to get that to work in in a, in a robust way in a use in even a two point where it was useful. You know. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's crazy. So you, you don't only have your hand like in, in nickel, you, you are so busy doing, I mean, so many other things you've, you have your hand in, in coral net. Tell us a little bit about coral net because that kind of helped lead you into nickel in a way. Correct. Yeah. In, in a way, I mean, coral net was the, uh, um, what do you, what do you call it in English? Um, I mean, especially the fruit of my whole PhD, right? So I started doing my PhD mm -hmm. years and I build it out. And CoralNet is a platform for automated annotation of underwater images, specifically coral reef surveys or, or any, any bottom of the ocean surveys. Um, and it's similar to nickel in the sense that you, anyone, any, any researcher, basically, this is usually like, so we actually do have no other uh, big, um, uh, U.S. you know agency using it for their surveys, and there's mm -hmm. a lot of reef monitors across the world, but but also a lot of researchers that they upload their images, they do annotations right there in the browser, and then we we do the machine learning for them and, and sort of predict predict the rest of the, their data for them. So it addresses this for what we call the manual annotation and bottleneck in when you do these surveys because nowadays. When I started my PhD, um, if you any 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 of these marine labs you went to, they would have hundreds of thousands of images lying around. Because if you go and deploy a diver or a submarine, obviously you have a digital camera, and obviously you're going to end up taking tons and tons of photographs. But the the annotation of these photographs, the assignment of what is actually in them, require like a grad student in like uh, marine biology or marine marine ecology it was extremely expensive and extremely slow so there was this gap between they had maybe one percent of their data annotated and unless it's annotated you can't actually draw any scientific conclusions from it right sure so you were missing out on a lot of statistical significance in in that was available in the image data and that's where uh coral met us you know come in to to, to address that gap nice yeah, yeah. So it is, I, I know that you like to surf and uh, stuff How like that. that? Cause I, <laughs> cause when I was looking for information on you for this, I ended up mm -hmm. seeing a bunch of uh, uh, GoPro videos <laughs> of you. So nice. I know that you like to surf. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering if, if that was kind of your, your start for, for coral net just kind of wanting to help save uh, save the reef and stuff like that so you could you could go out and, and surf. Uh, just kind of an aside there. Yeah, uh, yeah, was that, yeah. I mean, was that part of why you wanted to do that? It was, It was. I think it was part of why I choose it. I, I was very lucky. Like when I started my PhD, my, my PhD advisor, David Kriegman, had together with, um, he wrote, the, wrote and got accepted an NSF grant with uh, Greg Mitchell and David Klein from, from Scripps uh, Institution of Oceanography. So they had the funding. And basically when I started my PhD, my advisor told me, well, you can go and um, solve like, you know, this imaging and uh, coral reef imaging problem, or you can do this other grant, which is doing face detection for the Navy. Um, and it just seemed like for me as a, you know, uh, I want to say like semi hippie surfer, it seemed more seem like a better fit to go and uh, try and save the oceans. Oh, nice. So it was mostly luck, but it was, uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for them for that. It was a, it was a fun project. Yeah. Um, also, tell me about uh, this algorithmic framework and the hardware design for this invisible helmet, this invisible bicycle helmet that you you worked with uh, the Hovding for. Uh, cause that's, that's a pretty crazy thing too. If you haven't looked up the people that are watching here, if you haven't looked up this invisible bicycle helmet, that's pretty, that's a pretty cool deal. 
Yeah, Hövding is funny. It's one of, I mean, it's been around for 10 years now or so, uh, but it's not sold in the US. So here, every every few years, one of those videos goes viral and people are like, what, the, what is that? <laughs> like, it just kind of <laughs> surprises everyone again. Uh, but it's actually in production and, and uh, on, in sale in Europe and uh, parts of Asia. Um, so Hövding was my first job out of my master's in Sweden. Um, and it was actually kind of crazy because the, the two founders of that company were both designers, right? So they had the designers and entrepreneurs, right? So they had the idea for the for this helmet that was supposed to be an airbag bicycle helmet that you sort of fold into a collar and around your neck and zip it up and kind of engage it. And then the, their idea was to use machine learning or some sort of signal processing to detect as you're flying through the air, as you're like in the middle of the accident, you would detect that you're in the accident and then inflate a, a hood that comes up around your head and protects you. So they, they somehow got a hold of me and I was the first engineer on the, on the company and, and uh, basically was tasked with the, figuring out if this is at all possible. Uh, and this is from a clean slate. So this is well, what sensors do you use? Uh, what what uh, compute, pro, like compute hardware do you use? And then um, how do you design the algorithm? Uh, and that, that was a journey. I mean, you can have to stop me because I can talk for, for a long time about this. Uh, <laughs> maybe, I mean, maybe a couple of nuggets. I mean, the sensor back then, this was before the iPhone. So like the, uh, the micro, uh, the MEMS, the MEMS sensor, I forget what it stands for, like a micro electronic something. They were so primitive that you couldn't even buy like a, a, gy- a gyro that had three, like mm-hmm. three axes. So you had to buy, uh, to measure angular velocity in three dimensions, we had to actually buy three of them and like have, have two of them sort of stand uh, perpendicular up on the chip, like just mount them like this. Um, and uh, and then we had an accelerometer and then we basically said, okay, well, let's try and get some data. Uh, and maybe I'll ask you, how would you, how would you go about that? Like, how do you even, how do you know, like what the fall looks like and how do you, measure how do you get data to know if it's going to work like how do you set that up what would you do well i i would just start watching people well probably dummies fall mm-hmm. just start setting up accidents and and yeah. watching them do it and just like, start measuring like, crash, like, crash like they do with kind of crash test dummies yeah 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 and just seeing what the inertia looks like and uh, yeah. I, I guess that's how that's how you would have to start going about it yeah, so that's what so, we did. We got these these crash test dummies, put the put the list like device on them that logged all the motions, and started driving into them with cars and have them. But but the problem was there it was too expensive. The dummies uh, are very expensive to rent, and they're also very slow. They, they're very heavy, obviously the, the the weight of a whole human being, right? So you getting them on a bike mm-hmm. and having that bike like kind of balance it was a nightmare. So we, we had to go to a cheaper alternative, which is real humans, uh, and they specifically stunt professionals. So we went to the, the movie industry in Stockholm and found their stunt professionals and had them actually do all the all the accidents, stage all the accidents. So we literally were like standing <laughs> with a broom handle and like just jamming into their to bike wheel as they were biking by. And we had high-speed cameras. That's up crazy. So we, could, so we could time everything out. Um, so that's how we started collecting the data. Um, and that's, once we had the data, it was like, well, it was way too hard to write an explicit algorithm. And so, yeah, we, we sort of naturally came to machine learning and that was my first real experience with, a you know, deploying applied machine learning. That's, that's pretty cool. That's, that had to have been a lot of fun. Yeah. Just it was a real start. Crashing people was, around. Yeah. yeah. That's. <laughs> yeah, that was a real startup uh, adventure for sure. Um, yeah. Oh, hey, got to start somewhere. Might as well start by crashing people into into cars. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Um. So that that all happened in Sweden, as as you keep saying. What brought you over to the states? I mean, um, it was actually surfing, uh, believe it or not. Um, yeah. Well, I guess I guess you would believe it since you found my YouTube account, but um, yeah, I had, I'd been like this. This is like there's a breed of like European traveling surfers that you bump into when you're out backpacking, and I was I was one of them. I was taking as much time as I could off from work and school and go go travel for months and come back. Um, so somewhere along there, uh, in the middle of that, I promised myself I would try and live in the U.S. Um, 
and uh, and I would say that's about half the story. The other half was that you know after having done having and built this AI system or machine learning system, I was I was very hungry to become better at it. Like I was just I, it got me really really fascinated. So I wanted to go to a good um, school in the US and really cement that knowledge. Uh, so that's that's how I applied to UC UCSD. Um, I was lucky to get a spot there. Well, yeah, and what what better place to be able to go to school and surf in San Diego, right? Yeah, yeah, that yeah. wasn't a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> right on. So, yeah. besides surfing, is there anything that you do to to help yourself get away from from work? Well, actually, after a couple of years in San Diego, I realized that there's too many people surfing in the water with you, and it's it's a little bit too cold and and it, it was always hard for me to squeeze in surfing before work. When I wake up in the morning, I, I just want to start working. I, I, I can't. It's very hard for me to go and do something first. I'm just all about getting into it. Um, so I ended up playing, started playing beach volleyball instead, um, which is oh, at nice. least close to the ocean. Um, and that's actually how I met the, my, you know, the, the first co-founder of Nickel, so, so Dan. Dan and I started playing together on the beach and we immediately connected because we were both, you know, in software and technology and so on. Um, and then we both moved up to the Bay Area for a while and and then uh, got to know each other better and, and eventually started uh, Nickel. So, um, yeah, beach volleyball has been, been a big part of my life as well. Cool. I, I don't live anywhere near the beach. I am in landlocked Colorado, but, uh, yeah. you know, growing up in in high school we we played as much beach volleyball as we could you know around the around the little lakes and stuff as we nice. we had now i am i am quite a bit uh bigger and more out of shape and haven't played that for quite a while uh but i did used to love uh love volleyball yeah. so i get you there i i do i do love that sport it's a really fun sport um, I, I recommend yeah it, it is it's a it's a lot of fun. Um, I yeah. think I'd be winded as as soon as I stepped on the sand right now. Uh, unfortunately, uh, probably yeah. should, probably should think about getting back into that though. I, I, that sounds like a, a lot of fun. Now that you've it's said that, yeah, I should. The, it, it's very gentle on the body. That's one thing. You know, it's not injury prone at all, uh, which I think is uh, it, which is one of the reasons there's a lot of oldies on the court. Like I started playing when I was thirty, and there was a lot of lot of us that started. You know, that's very late, right? If you would look at other sports. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a great sport. It's a lot of fun. Um, so let's, let's kind of shift a little bit back into, into work here. Mm -hmm. Um, you are listed as either the founder or director of three different, um, companies right now, um, actively. How do you balance all that? Now, I understand you have, you're one of four co-founders at Nickel. Yep. Um, but still, I mean, that's that's three different companies right now. Yep. How do you balance all that? How do you keep everything going? How do you keep all the plates spinning everywhere? Is that something that's hard to do? Yeah, it's pretty hard to do. I mean, three is true only in a technical sense. I mean, CoralNet is like, it's my little pet project I'll never probably stop working on CoralNet, but it's it's a very light load right now. So we have okay. a software developer that's on kind of part-time staff at UCSD. So he he's really the one pushing it uh, for uh, Stefan Chen, and he he really owns that right now. I I, I mostly check in every, every few weeks on some pull request or some issue or something like that. So you're technically right, but it's really just just two, uh, two things that I'm, I'm, I'm doing right now. Um, so yeah, I mean, I am the, um, my quote unquote day job, I suppose, is the, uh, senior director of machine learning at, at Motional, uh, which is one of the big, uh, AI, uh, car shops. And I actually started that team when I joined the company like five years ago. So I, I've grown that team from, from me to, you know, almost hundred people or so. Uh, nice. and I think, good job. I think, yeah. Yeah, thank you. It was, I mean, that in itself was a, was, a, was a big journey. It was really fun. Um, but I think that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm able to juggle it because I, I know the team so well. I've been with the company so long. 
Um, and obviously, I have I'm very lucky to have support from from upper management and, and my my direct boss and so on to like kind of stay in this role uh, while I uh, while I try uh, try nickel and see where that leads us. Um, and of course, my you know my co-founders are are amazing as well. They they just like yeah makes sense. You know, it's a good gig. Stay with that a little bit. Uh, while well, we see if this has uh, legs, you know, like there's there's a long period when you start a company where you you get some traction and 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 you you're trying to figure out what's the right direction and uh, just sort of it's a little bit uh, yeah yeah they they were nice about that letting me stay on um, nice and there That's are great. And there are some and there are some synergies right I mean the, it is I'm doing pretty sure. much the same thing right one of the, my jobs at at as as at, at emotional is basically running the, um, the our machine learning platform, right? That motion, obviously that looked completely different and it's all in house and it's very custom and so on. But I think, I think has, having sort of one foot in, in both sides helped me get better at both jobs. Like I'm learning things at nickel, like technologies, ideas, concepts that I can bring back to, to motion and so on, um, vice versa. Sure. It's still. I mean, Nickel is, is very much in the startup phase, and that's just, I mean, that's that's a job in and of itself, keeping a startup going. You yeah. know, I mean, that's that's almost a, a double-time job uh, just to do that. So to, to have your feet, you know, one foot on either side is, man, that's a lot of work. So keep it up, buddy. Uh, yeah, thank you. Keep it up. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so one of the things you said, you, you know, you, you like to talk about anything that's, uh, related to ML and in particular related to ML infrastructure. So kind of expand on that a little bit. Are you, what kind of ML infrastructure are you talking about? Are you talking about like infrastructure of, of cities or just infrastructure of just machine learning itself what what kind of infrastructure are you, are you speaking about there well so here's the thing um obviously ai machine learning is it's very hyped right now and you see tons of people flocking to the programs that teach deep learning machine learning and so on right um mm -hmm. and there's a misconception that when you do machine learning that you kind of sit there and you um maybe experiment with a new neural network architecture and then you kind of uh, maybe write some math or, you know, like, uh, and then and then you come up with a great result and write a paper. In, you know, in reality, when you, when you do machine learning, you're doing 90 to 95% of just managing complexity of, of your data and your experiments. So the reality of modern machine learning is that there is no real, there's no reliable theory to, to uh, rely on. So you can say, okay, for this particular problem, let's say this is the one you looked at, right? So I have birds, animals, and some nature photos. There's no theory mm -hmm. to tell you that, okay, for that problem, you, you should use this particular neural network architecture design with this loss function and, and this, this amount of data. No, it's all trial and error. Right? It's all experience um, and trial and error, right? And what that means is that to be effective to to search effectively right so you need to 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 win you have to search as many possible things as uh, as you can in the shortest amount of time that means that you end up building a lot of infrastructure like even if you do this for yourself you need to have your data organized in a way that can be loaded up quickly um uh, you know and uh, at at the right data center for example you, you need to spin up some sort of job okay. management system so you can spin up, say, 100 GPU <laughs> nodes at the same time and try 100 things at the same time. And now you have 100 things to look at. So now you need to figure out, well, how do I consolidate and reconcile all these results? How do I pick the best model? How do I then need to spin up the next round of experiments? Um, and all of that minutia is, uh, takes an insane amount of time, right? And that's, so when people talk about machine learning platforms, that's typically what they, what they refer to. Um, the management of all of that. Um, yeah. All right. Well, that makes sense. Um, you've also written quite a few papers. I was, I was looking 
uh, you know, on your GitHub and your your Scholar page. Yeah. Uh, I didn't have enough time to read, you know, quite er- everything. But you you've written quite a few papers, so uh, you're obviously quite a learned person. I mean, you have your PhD. You've you've had to go through uh, quite a bit of this, you know, quite a bit of schooling, quite a bit of learning. You're you're a very driven and passionate person. Um. So what, like what? What's the motivation? When did all this start? Were you young when all this kind of started with you? What what was kind of the catalyst for you wanting to get into this? I mean, so if you ask about machine learning specifically, uh, it was a true case of it always inspired me. Like I, you know, I did actually engineering physics in Sweden, which is, um, kind of, you know, math, physics, style engineering. And a lot of people go into control theory, um, actually just straight up applied physics, solid state physics. Uh, a lot of people go into banking and so on uh, because you need like the, the, the math jobs and so on. Um, but mm-hmm. I, the, the one thing that stuck with me was the, uh, this, this kind of AI feel like take an image, <laughs> figure out what's in the image, I classify that image. And back then it was a terrible, career choice. There was no jobs, you know, maybe Google was doing it in the US, but certainly not in Sweden. There was like not a single big company that was like hiring machine learning people, right? Uh, it just wasn't a thing. Um, but I went with my guts, the gut instinct there and, and sort of specialized in that. And then I got lucky with, with having, uh, be, having an opportunity to actually apply it. Uh, and then sort of, it just kind of kept going from there. So it's, I think I, I've been really lucky. It's just such a fascinating field and I do enjoy learning a lot. Um, and it's such a rich space to learn from. Like I'm, I'm trying to learn more about the machine learning theory, right? Which is the math and statistics underpinning of this, um, uh, the modern sort of deep learning, uh, architectures. And then and there's a lot of, obviously, um, there's, there's so many papers, uh, written, you know, every week about new architectures and new designs. Um, and then there's the software, you know, like I said, once you get into this, once you start doing this for years, you realize that the machine learning part is, is a small part. What really matters, especially if you grow a team and an organization is to have the right software architecture underlying all this and the right software infrastructure and and hardware infrastructure. So then I become interested in, in those things as well. Uh, and I don't know, it's just, I enjoy learning it and it's, it's, it's really rewarding. Um, you know. (laughs) <laughs> what else yeah. yeah no no you're fine you're fine that's enough um there's one thing that i've i've kind of learned i've i've only hosted a few of these shows um you know comparatively to to the uh the co-founders that uh of xfusion here mm-hmm. but the one thing that i've i've noticed is um like you've written and you said you there's a lot of papers and and you like to read um so reading is a kind of a common ground for uh leaders um is there anything specifically that you like to read i mean besides like papers on the subject do you like to read any any books specifically are you just a reader in general um yeah, I mean, I've always read books, uh, for sure. And I actually think that has helped me with my writing. Uh, so I, uh, just reading novels, right? Uh, you, you, you get mm-hmm. a sense for how you can articulate yourself, how you can write effectively. Um, but yeah, I, I also right now I have a, a book on my, that's a table called, uh, it's called a like clean code or something like that, which is a really old, like, people that, that study software engineering, they, it's a, they, all, they know about this book. It's a very classic <clears throat> book about how you write good code, code that uh, kind of can stand the test of time and it's clean and so on. And obviously right now I'm also reading a lot of books about organization, um, startup, uh, Peter, Peter Thiel's Zero to One was one I recently read, for example. Um, yeah, I don't mind. Like my wife is like, you just work all day and then you go to bed reading about like 
code, like how to write code. <laughs> yeah, it's perfect. It's actually perfect it's in, because it's, it's, in, it's interesting. It's in my DNA, it, babe. <laughs> it's like it's interesting enough that it like takes my mind off all the other stuff, right? And then I can fall asleep. Uh, whereas if I'm reading yeah. a novel, I might not even get into it, and I'm still thinking about work. Yeah. So you're you're nine months into this thing with nickel um what so far is your biggest pain point uh that you can you guys can see with nickel i mean i think it's just a constant uncertainty of, of what exactly is nickel right so you we think we know what it is right we, we try and write it down we try to formulate it for ourselves going on on doing things like this is actually very useful because it helps me sort of it forces myself to articulate what nickel is right and sure. and every time you do that you, you kind of refine the thesis for, for what you're doing um but you know so you have a, like you have a concept for what you want to try and build and where that will what that would look like in the future but then you also have users on the site, right? That have that may not look exactly what you thought they would, right? Um, and, and and you also further don't know is that like was that a one-off thing or is that like if I keep digging in that direction, there's a whole mountain over there that I should be like tapping into or or selling to or, or customizing the product for. So I think that uncertainty is like crazy we you know like it's very hard to get a handle on that uh, what is sort of the right direction for the company sure so right now who who are you guys going after what what is your what is your icp what what's the niche you're niche you're going after yeah, so we're going after basically so the we, our hypothesis is that there is a long tail of software developers or, you know, just engineers, right, that want to use machine mm -hmm. learning, but they they don't have a machine learning background. They don't have a machine learning team in their company because, you know, they might work for a small company or, or they're just not the focus of that particular company. Uh, but they still want to get into machine learning. And they want something simple, right? So we have customers, a few use cases that we've seen. It's like someone... Um, they have a, a, a store, a web store, where they sell like natural foods. Um, and they have people, you know, in the warehouse packaging these natural foods, going to orders. Uh, but a lot of food items come in bulk, right? So they don't have a barcode mm -hmm. scanner for that, naturally. So they needed to build a sort of barcode-less barcode scanner. And they use Nickel for that. So they basically they had 50 or so different <laughs> types of bulk products, took pictures of all of them, labeled them in Nickel, and then they have an endpoint that they can then put in production, so that when the workers like show the show the bag, and then Nickel knows what it is, and they can charge the right thing, and they can confirm that the right thing was packed. So examples like that, where it's very huh. custom, right? It's very custom. Yeah. Uh, you can so Google, you know, there's like Google, Amazon, the, those guys. They all they have these like ready-made vision APIs that can tell you, you know. Is there a dog or a cat or a tree or a mouse or a, or a person in this image? It, it's it's a very custom thing that you can do. Uh, you don't need that much data for. So, yeah. Okay. So th that's that, that's the hypothesis that there is a lot of things like that. So it's it's very much the <clears throat> well going going back to your website you can make it learn the very specific, uh, you know, is this a bird? Is this yeah. not a bird? You know, and you can make it learn exactly what you want it to learn in a very short amount of time. And then you can make it do what you want it to do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. With, with very, very little work on your end. Really? Yeah. 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 Exactly. No, that's great. That's great. Um, so going back, say go back 10 years, knowing what you know now, or even, you know, 10, 15 years, what advice would you give yourself now from yourself 10 years ago? <laughs> 10 years ago, so probably, <laughs> probably by the time I moved to the U.S., um, 
I don't know, man. <laughs> I think it worked out pretty well. <laughs> no, I mean, jokes aside, I've, I've, I've actually, I don't have a lot of regrets for professionally. It's been such a, such a fun Great. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty much exactly where I was hoping I would be. Like, I, I feel like I have a pretty good understanding of the, the space. Uh, I have established myself to some extent as a expert or a professional in the space. And, and now I get to kind of try and, uh, Start start a company with some friends. So, the, yeah, I would say. Uh, well, keep that's it, keep awesome. It yeah, awesome. Keep uh, yeah. keep doing what you were doing ten years ago. Yeah. Just just tell yourself, keep keep the fight. Yeah, upward upward and to the right. Yeah, exactly. And that's uh, yeah, and that that's where I I hope you keep going now. Upward and to the right. I I like this. I like this idea, um, and I, I, I hope that uh, everything that you're doing, you know, just keeps, just keeps moving. I, I really like the idea of making my life easier uh, with with a lot less work on the computer side. I, uh, yeah, I bring this up a lot. I'm I'm not the technical guy. I'm the people guy, right? I'm the chief of staff. I, this is my first job into the the tech world. Yeah. Um, I've, I've lived my, my life working, making my living, like I said, on my back, you know, working in the oil field, uh, construction, that kind of thing. So, yeah. you know, st- stuff like this that can make, might make my life easier. I, I like when it comes to, uh, technical. Um, so the last couple questions I asked these to, to everybody that's on the show. Yeah. Um, what, what advice would you give to founders? or soon to be founders that are going to watch this program. Um, I mean, I, I feel like I'm a little bit, a little bit too junior in the starting game to give, give good advice. But, um, I suppose if I if you put me on the spot, I, I don't wouldn't. think so. You, uh, you've been <laughs> playing this game for, for a, a little while. I think, I think you yeah. can give some good advice. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think that you um, there's a real balance between like I feel like if you, if you think too hard about it, if you do too many um, market surveys and try to write down exactly what your product is going to do and exactly what your customer segment is, you're never going to get started. So I like to iterate between blinders on, just build something, um, and then kind of look up every once in a while and see, look around and see like, okay, well. What is the competitive landscape um, around me right now? Uh, what kind of people are coming to the site, and, and why? Why are some people going to the other site, or, or, or uh, and then sort of go back into to blinders on mode and build? Because um, otherwise, you just kind of double second guess yourself constantly. Mm-hmm. Nice. And then uh, last question is. What is the best way for viewers to get in touch with you? You have quite a few. You have quite a few ways to get in touch with you. So what, what's the best way to do that? Yeah. I mean, that's that's what, what you get from being in academia in a very public role, right? So, uh, I mean, I think my email might even be on, on my website. I don't remember. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, Oscar at Nickel, obviously, if you're interested in, in Nickel, Nickel-related matters, Oscar at Nickel.com. Uh, it's, it's probably the best way. I'm on, I'm on LinkedIn. You can ping me there. Okay. Very good. Um, I would say everybody take a look at Nickel. Um, it's a it's a pretty great uh, pretty great website. It's very attractive. Um, just take a look at the. It's like a minute and a half video, kind of giving them a, a rundown of of how things work and it's uh nyckel.com uh oscar bay boom it was a pleasure having you on the show thanks for being on the show buddy yeah thank you so much for having me it's a pleasure